So I'm excited to welcome everybody to the 2020-2021 season of the Heritage University Faculty Research Scholarship Series. This is, of course, our first year as a virtual series, and thus all sessions will be recorded, which has actually been long a dream of those of us uh, in the center, and we are really grateful to Davison Mancy because he is helping us with making this recording a success and then getting it out to more people through our various Heritage University media venues. So thank you, Davison, for helping us. The topic that we're starting the series with is Gridlock, an intro to crossword construction. Dr. Blake Sloniker, who happens to be Chair of Humanities, which has the, the new and upcoming history major and Interim Chair of Psychology, has published, if you can imagine, 15 crossword puzzles since he started constructing in 2018, including puzzles in the Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, Chronicle of Higher Education, which I know we all read on our lunch break, um, <laughs> and Universal Crossword. Universal Crossword is America's leading syndicated puzzle. His first New York Times puzzle will be published later this year. So I want to turn the remaining time over to Dr. Blake Sloniker to tell us all about this process. So take it away. Unmute. Awesome. Thank you, Mary, for the introduction, <laughs> which I wrote. <laughs> um, so I'm thrilled to see so many people here. This is the first time that I've sort of talked or shared um, about crossword construction. So um, hopefully it goes well enough. I also want to uh, shout out to my friend Caleb, who is on the Zoom call. He's uh, from the Bay Area, so he probably wins our distance award for participating um, today. Uh, I want to begin, so first of all, there's, this is going to be a highly participatory uh, talk, so I want you all to feel really free to unmute your mics and shout out answers as um, clues or, or uh, things come along. Uh, you can even uh, probably for most people, leave just yourself unmuted altogether. Um, noise is fine. Um, I want to begin my talk by just kind of getting you all warmed up um, by playing a little bit of an anagrams game. So here's how the, uh, the anagrams game is going to work. Uh, I will introduce a sentence or two um, that then ends with a blank space. And the word that goes in the blank space has to be spelled with the letters that are included in heritage. Okay, so no Q's, no S's, um, but those are the letters that we have. And then this will introduce kind of a meta uh, clue that you all can ponder for the next 40 minutes while I'm talking about other things. Um, let me move something around here real quick. Uh, okay. All right, big cats aren't common on the heritage campus. So we were surprised to see a prowling, shout it out if you've got it. Panther. Tiger. Tiger. Yeah. Nice, tiger. <laughs> Most heritage students wear a face mask, but I decided to wear a neck. Tie. Gator. Oh, gator. Gator, there we go. Uh, the Heritage Campus gets cold in the winter, so we sometimes gather around a space. Peter. 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 Now, Peter. Uh, don't tell Joseph that because he comes around campus and tells us we are not allowed to have space heaters on campus, but <laughs> we'll just have to forgive or forget that. Heritage PA students didn't have any modern anesthetics on hand, so they had to use... Hmm. <laughs> Ether. Ether. Ether, there we go. Oh, oh it does work. Uh, large meetings on the Heritage Campus are banned. So we aren't allowed to gather. 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 There we go. <laughs> A lot of people got that one. 
heritage classes, uh, the heritage class didn't seem excited to learn. So the professor tried a new activity to make the students more engaged. engaged. This is the weakest one. I think. <laughs> I'll just ruin it. Eager. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sushi and sandwiches were both going fast at the dining commons, but that was okay. The last student in line would be happy with this one six Either. letters. Either. Either, and that's right. Uh, the heritage professor received great course evaluations with the exception of feedback from one Five letters. Hater. Hater, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we all have those, right? Right. All right, and then this is the meta puzzle. This is what you need to think about over the course of the next 40 minutes. The anagrams were in such bad shape that they all ended up at the... And we will revisit that question uh, in a little while. Bar. So, thank you all for participating. Uh, that was great, lots of different voices. Um, and some of the anagrams are better than others. Um, this talk is premised on the idea that people have a, some level of interest in crossword puzzles, but probably don't know the nuts and bolts of creating one, um, or even some of the rules that maybe uh, you take for granted when you open up or look at a crossword puzzle. Um, so I want to begin by just describing like what, what are the rules that are required when you are creating um, a grid, or in this case, or for crossword constructors, the grid is the actual 15 by 15 or 21 by 21 space. So the first element is you have to have symmetry. And symmetry in this case means the symmetry of two things. One is the black squares. So if you take the uh, puzzle grid, um, the black squares will be arrayed in such a way that if you turn it 180 degrees upside down, the black squares will be in exactly the same place. The second component of symmetry is that the theme answers have to be symmetrically arrayed in the grid. So if you have a 13 letter entry, three lines down from the top and to the right, you must also have a 13 letter entry, three up from the bottom and to the left. And we'll look at examples of this. Um, I don't want to display them because we'll, we'll have a challenge here in a second. Uh, second one, this one's a lot easier. Words have to be at least three letters long with very, very, very few exceptions, uh, that's the case. Uh, all of the different sections of the grid have to be able to lead into the others. So in other words, you should be able to start in one part of the grid and then move around and complete it without having, uh, and being able to build from one word to the other. So I'm gonna throw four grids up on the screen, only one of which is a legitimate grid. And, and I want you all to figure out which one is the legitimate grid uh, out of these four. Can you all see all of the grids? I, I have a little bit of a block. Yes. Okay. So which of these is legitimate based on our rules there? Hmm. Oh. Top right. Top right. Top right. Yep. This one up here, it's got those cool plus signs. Um, I've actually decided in creating this grid that I'm gonna try to fill that and make a themeless puzzle with it. Um, what's, what's no good about the one on the top left? This one over here. Sections are cut off. Sec sections are cut off. Uh, what about on the bottom left? What's, what's not legitimate there? Not symmetrical. Not symmetrical. And actually, this is kind of an interesting grid, but it does not meet the symmetry requirement. If you were to flip it upside down, that C in the middle would be facing a different direction. Occasionally, uh, editors will let you run puzzles that um, have left-right symmetry rather than the 180-degree symmetry, but this one wouldn't fit that requirement either. Uh, and then what's wrong in the bottom right? It's two-letter words. Two-letter words. There's actually a lot of two-letter words in that one. Um, so that's what, when you, when you look at a crossword grid, um, in general, it looks kind of balanced and there's actually a whole um, set of rules that make sure that that's the case. There are, there are also some additional rules that are a little bit smaller uh, regarding fill and construction. One is that words can't repeat. 
um, we, uh, constructors will talk about there being dupes, which is short for duplicates. So if the word now appears somewhere in one answer, it can't appear uh, in a different answer. So that's, uh, that's bad. You will, uh, if you're a careful crossword solver, um, you will sometimes see dupes in a puzzle. Um, and uh, bloggers are oftentimes really ruthless in describing and making fun of people for including dupes in their puzzles. Um, there's also some basic rules about size and word counts. So most weekday puzzles are 15 by 15. Uh, and if it's a themed puzzle, you're only allowed 78 words. And if it's unthemed, 72 words can fit. Uh, Sunday puzzles are 21 by 21. So they're larger uh, puzzles as well. Um, so that, those are the basic rules. Now what I want to do for the rest of our time together is talk about the actual process by which a puzzle uh, gets made. Uh, and I'm doing it in, in, in the order in which um, most constructors work. So um, pretty much every crossword puzzle begins with a, the idea of its theme as the starting point. Um, and uh, a theme has some certain rules about it as well. So what, it's first important to understand what a theme is not. A theme is not just a collection of things um, in common. Um, so you, you wouldn't just have five trees and call that a theme or, or six authors and call that a theme. You wouldn't just list the seven deadly sins and consider that a theme. Um, every theme, pretty much, with very few exceptions, has to involve um, some sort of wordplay. Uh, and there needs to be an answer somewhere in the grid that's called the revealer, uh, where the answer and the clue to that grid is going to, to clue you in to how the theme is working. And we're going to look at examples of all of these. Um, occasionally, for those puzzles that are run with titles, uh, the Wall Street Journal has a title for every puzzle. The New York Times and the LA Times do not have titles. But if you have a title, sometimes you can have the, the puzzles revealer included in the title uh, as well. So what does this look like? Um, themes can operate. There's no rules about what makes for a good theme. Um, a good theme, you know it when you see it. The revealer very clearly suggests to the solver what's going on in the puzzle. So. I want to look at some examples, four or five examples of, of themes that I've created over the past couple of years um, to show that sort of the different variety of puzzles. Um, so here's a puzzle um, that I published in the LA Times. We'll see the puzzle in a second. And the clue for the revealer was mesclun, I think I'm pronouncing that right, and a hint to the circled squares. Does anyone know what mesclun is? Caleb has solved this puzzle, so he knows it, I know. I think it's like lettuce. Solved it, but I don't remember. <laughs> it's like lettuce, yeah. Lettuce. So mi mixed oh, greens. Yeah. I'm assuming the French origin of mess is, is mixing. I don't know. I, may, I might be making that up. Um, so the question is, does this suggest to anyone potential um, theme ideas? <clears throat> mixed greens. What might you do with that? Well, I'll tell you what I did with it. If you shout out if you have different ideas. Um, so the grid is off to the right there. And you can see that the, in the circled letters, you have um, five different types of salad greens that are mixed. So we have anagrams here of, um, of greens. So chips and dip at the beginning of that has an anagram for spinach, right? Uh, tile cutter. Oh. Uh, includes those letters, which is an anagram for lettuce, lettuce, lettuce. and for bike lanes, we have kale. Kale. My favorite in this one is inaugural. What do you get from that? Arugula. Arugula, and then shard is contained in card holder. Um, so this this was a, a puzzle theme that just came from, uh, I was looking for, I was trying to write an anagram puzzle um, and I, I wanted a word, in this case mixed, that would suggest sort of the tossing together of letters. 
Um, and so mixed greens is what I came up with. It's worth noting you could do the exact same puzzle, but instead of having actual salad greens, you could have different colors of green. So you could anagram emerald as part of a larger one, and it could potentially be just as successful of a puzzle. Can I ask uh, you a question? Blake? Yeah, for sure. So um, I think that crossroad puzzles are really cool, but I want to ask you this question, and this will let you know that I don't do them, but I think they're cool. So are you saying that when people get ready to do crowd, because I, I used to do them sometimes, but I never did see this little revealer thing on the side. Is that in there, or is that just kind of the thought of when you're um, designing the crossword puzzle? Like, you have a theme in your head, like, people will get this. Um, so... This would appear, when, if you were to open this actual puzzle in the newspaper, there would just be a long list of clues. One of them would be this clue here, mescaline and a hint to the circled squares. So that would be in there. It's not set aside in any meaningful way. Um, however, theme revealers are usually found in the bottom right or in the exact center of a puzzle. Um, and they often will have a clause like this one does. It'll have a clue and then it will say, and, you know, something like that. Um, so this was your 53 across. 53 across. Okay. Yep. yep. Thanks and then, for asking uh, that, Gloria. Yeah. Um, it's worth noting the USA Today is one of the most frequently done crossword puzzles in the country. Um, and it, only runs unthemed puzzles. Um, so there's a whole bunch of people out there who are solving crossword puzzles every day, um, but who are not engaging with themes in this way. And the, the USA Today is a great puzzle, but it's, it's different from pretty much every other one. Yep. Okay, so let's look at another one here. Um, the revealer is Auld Lang Sign Trigger and a hint to this puzzle's theme. Anyone want to guess what the revealer is there? Happy New Year. New Year's Something Day. about New Year's. Something or about midnight. New Year's. Yep, you're all getting close. In this I, case, would, I would say it, but you've already talked about all these with me a while ago, so it's it cheating. <laughs> okay, so ball drop, like the New, the New Year's Eve uh, ball drop. Um, so here's how this one works. This is probably my favorite puzzle that I published. It was published on New Year's Eve in the Wall Street Journal. Um, and you'll see, so I said earlier, you're not allowed to have dupes. The same word cannot appear multiple times in a grid. Uh, in this case, the theme was interesting enough to the editors that they allowed it. So the word ball, you'll see it at the beginning of three down and eight down and at the end of 34 down and 37 down. Um, how this puzzle worked is um, the, the consecutive letters B, A, L, L were all contained in the theme entries that run left to right. But when you get to the ball part of the phrase, the entry drops. So what am I talking about? <laughs> um, if you look at one across, can, can you all see my uh, cursor? Yeah. yeah. Yes. One across, it, the entry is go, oh, now it went away, go ballistic. Oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, four, four across is high ball glass. Uh, 51 across is water balloons. And 52 across is power ballad. So this is a good example of a, of a puzzle where, like, there's rules being broken here. You know, you're not, your, your entries are supposed to read clear across, but um, the revealer is interesting enough, especially for a puzzle on New Year's Day, that it's allowed to break the rules. And so if you were to look at the clues here, there was also a separate clue for ballpark, ski ball, and mothball. Uh, okay, so that's, that's one, one way of constructing a theme. Uh, here's the next one. Um, this is actually my most recent puzzle. 
start driving and a hint to the star entries. Can anyone think of a, uh, the meaning of driving that might be not driving a car? Golf. Golf. Yeah. So here the revealer is T off. You tee off. Um, and so uh, here what I want to do is um, look at the theme entries and then have you all tell me what's going on here. So there's a T missing. Yeah, T off means the T is off the words, it's missing. Yeah. So we have a bunch of uh, familiar phrases that have consecutive T's, but in this case, those, uh, one of those two T's gets dropped. Now th this creates nonsense phrases, uh, right? And when we get to the section in a little bit where I talk about clue writing, I'll show you how I clued these because um, the, the phrase mad hater, second time we've seen hater, um, doesn't, it's not really a phrase that's in usage, but mad hatter is. So I had to clue these in a way that was true to mad hater, um, but that um, would be solvable by someone who, for whom mad hater is essentially a nonsense term. So we'll, we'll return to this puzzle in a little bit. Uh, next theme. Uh, this is one that I'm working on right now. It hasn't been published. Um, group whose infamous block is found four times in this puzzle. Um, this is kind of a tricky one, uh, writers. So the revealer is writer's block. Um, so this is, uh, there's kind of two different things going on with how I've constructed this puzzle. Um, there's something called a rebus square and a rebus square is where you are allowed to put multiple letters into a single square. Um, these don't run very often, but they run often enough. Um, that it's worth knowing if you're wanting to solve crossword puzzles, it's something you want to have in mind. So you'll see um, Rand. So is it, is it, how do you pronounce it? Ayn Rand? Ayn Rand? I've never known. Rand. The writer Rand. Uh, we've got Harper Lee in the top right, uh, Edgar Allan Poe in the bottom left, and Stephen King in the bottom right. So I tried to have um, writers that were generally known. Uh, and then we have, you know, parking lot and smoking gun as theme entries there. Um, this puzzle, though, wouldn't actually appear in this way, if it ever appears anywhere, um, because the, the theme, writer's block, suggests that there needs to be a block, which is what um, crossword constructors call the black squares. So the puzzle oh, I did list the theme entries, would actually look like this, where uh, instead of those writers being, uh, appearing as rebus squares, there's just a black block there. Uh, so it's a writer's block, and the solver would have to know that those letters are there in order to be able to solve the crossing theme entries. Can I ask you another question? Like yeah. Do you, um, as a crossword person, um, do you ever know how hard your your puzzles are? Like, um, like, is there any you know data to say like people are really solving these? Or um, okay, yeah, great question, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But the short answer is. Almost all crossword puzzles that run themed puzzles, they get harder as the week unfolds. Um, so if you are wanting to get started in crossword solving, the best thing to do would be to try to solve a Monday puzzle in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the LA Times. And those are gonna have wordplay, they'll be themed puzzles, but those will be more accessible. And then they get harder as the week unfolds. Um, in the New York Times, Thursday is the hardest themed puzzle and then Fridays and Saturdays are unthemed. When you're creating a puzzle, you do have a sense of what you think is its difficulty level. And so you try to write clues that are easier or harder. Uh, 
depending on where you think it will run. But the editors ultimately decide that and sometimes you're just totally wrong. <laughs> uh, I've, I've had puzzles I thought were Monday puzzles appear as Thursday puzzles and vice versa. So, yeah. So that's a, a, a fairly yeah. subjective thing or is there a, a set of criteria for assessing the difficulty of a puzzle? It's a subjective thing. I mean, this puzzle we're looking at right now, this is clearly a Thursday puzzle. There's going to be black squares where there's supposed to be letters. It's, that's tricky. Um, but it, it's subjective, yeah. And one of the actual, one of the problems is that the editorial process for crosswords is, it's a little bit weird. You send a puzzle to the editor and they say, if they say yes, then at that point, the constructor will never see the puzzle again until it appears. They'll edit clues. Uh, they'll do all sorts of things to it. Uh, and so at no point when I'm writing clues, do I know this is a Tuesday puzzle. Uh, and so I would write Tuesday clues. When I'm writing it, I'm just guessing. And I actually think that's a flaw in the editorial process that crossword editors use, but it's, it's more efficient for them, I think. Blake, can I ask you a, a different topic question? Sure. <clears throat> Have you ever consorted with or talked to Will Shorts? Um, not, not really. I've received emails from his email account. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Will, Will Shorts has a ton of people working for him, and um, he has so many, um, so many things going on that... Um, that I've communicated frequently with his editorial team. I've received probably 50 rejection emails from them. <laughs> uh, and they, they, write, they write really detailed, really encouraging rejection emails. <laughs> In puzzle format? <laughs> no. So this is a great example for us to share with our writing students. Yes, I mean, uh, any, anyone who goes into writing in any format has to get used to rejection, for sure. And, um, but Blake, you have had puzzles accepted by the New York Times. Just Is one. right? Just yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, okay, but do they, do they send something congratulatory? Yeah, so the thing with the New York Times is when they reject your puzzle, the heading on that, the subject heading on that email is crossword. And that's it. And that's a rejection. If you get an acceptance, it's crossword yes. So you you know when you've gotten I've only gotten that once, but that the renowned for that. That's funny. Um, I'm going to move more quickly through this next one just because it's um, interesting. Um, there are different ways for a puzzle to play out. The, the same revealer for one person might result in one puzzle for one person and a different one for another person. So on the 50th anniversary of Woodstock, um, the Wall Street Journal published two puzzles that had the same revealer, two days apart. Um, this one here was written by Peter Collins, and it's a pretty traditional uh, Woodstock theme. At the top right, you see three days, and then in the middle of peace and music, in the bottom left, you see Woodstock. And then in the down entries, there's a bunch of first names of people who perform. So Jimi Hendrix, uh, they're, they're all around here. Um, when I wanted to write a Woodstock puzzle as well, and when I was thinking about Woodstock puzzles, I, my brain went somewhere totally different. Um, so I'm going to put up my theme entries and see if you can figure out what my brain did with Woodstock. Peanuts. Someone said something. Peanuts. Peanuts. Oh, nope. Nope. Though it could for sure. I'll put up the grid and then see what you come up with. Can... <coughs> Trees? Trees, yeah. So mm. a stock of wood. Um, <laughs> And maybe it's a good puzzle, maybe it's not very good, I don't know. <laughs> but for the 50th anniversary of Woodstock, I, I thought it was pretty cool that they ran. It, generally, if someone publishes a puzzle with one revealer, 
um, people are going to avoid that revealer for a while after that because it's been used. Um, but here I thought it was cool that their editor, Mike Shank, was willing to um, put two puzzles in conversation with each other in that way. Um, and that was fun. So my puzzle is the, the wood puzzle. Um, okay, so that's how theme works. And, and like I said, um, there's no set of rules for themes, but there needs to be a revealer and that revealer needs to suggest um, how the theme entries work. And it should work in a way where when you first read the revealer, it's unclear, but once you solve the puzzle, it's very clear. And that's the goal that you're shooting for. So then once you have the theme entries, the next step is actually constructing the grid, putting the words in the spaces. Um, for a hundred years, crossword constructors did that with pencil and paper um, and enormous vocabularies. Um, so they would draw a grid, they'd put black squares on, and then they would have to be thinking how to fill it. Um, I tried this for my first puzzle before I realized um, that there was software to help with this process. Um, and it took me two weeks, many hours during those two weeks. I was an unpleasant person to be around. Uh, and it, it was just really, really tough. Uh, today though, there's software um, that has in fundamental ways changed crossword construction. So there's a three-step process. You get the theme, you construct the grid, and you write the clues. Uh, coming up with good theme ideas is still manual creative process. Um, writing the clues is in general still a manual and creative process. Um, compiling, uh, creating the grid is not. And I just want to show you all how um, this works. Uh, let's see here. Share screen. Okay, so this is the software that I use. It's called Crossfire. And um, what it will do, you'll see in a moment, is it's going to tell me when I select a spot in the grid, every single word that exists in my word list that could fit there and still be a fillable grid. Okay, so I will click here on fill and everything that appears in bold, my software is telling me, uh, you can put that word here and you'll still be able to create a grid that is coherent. So unlike that first time when I was trying to fill a grid just using my brain and like a dictionary, um, and that requires people to have really big working vocabularies. Um, now, um, I, I, liken, I liken crossword grid filling to a curator at an art museum. The curator doesn't have to create the art. They just have to go down into the museum's holdings and pick out those things that will make for the best displays. Uh, and my, my job in um, filling a grid is to um, come to the conclusion that, uh, let's see, team sports is a more interesting fill than Annie Potts. I don't think very many people would know who Annie Potts is. I don't know who Annie Potts is. It's all subjective, but that's what, um, that's Shelby what is, uh, that's how grids are filled. So it would look like this. Let's put dress pants in. Let's come down here and, uh, oh, I like class, nope, not Earthmen. I don't like that. Class rep. Mm -hmm. uh, loose end is fun. So Blake, is this just one of many programs that has this word selection like kind of algorithm or are there like many different variations of this like Crossfire? Yeah, there's, so the two that I'm familiar with are Crossfire and Crossword Compiler. Huh. Um, and here's the interesting thing about them. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, Uh, the, the software is only as good as the word list. 
So when I first bought this software, it comes with a word list built in and it's a, a very small word list and I couldn't fill any grids at all. And there are people who curate word lists out there and you can subscribe to them that have hundreds of thousands of words and phrases in them. And once I subscribed to a word list that's kept by a guy named Jeff Chen who lives in Seattle, all of a sudden, just like that, my software went from completely worthless really to like an incredible abil uh, ability to create puzzles. So if you have a lot of good words in your word list, you can create good puzzles. And if your word list doesn't, then you're not going to create good puzzles. But again, what, what your job is in constructing a puzzle at the stage of filling, your job is to be able to identify those words that are better than others. And it's completely a subjective process, but uh, you're looking for words that are kind of fresh, um, words that suggest fun clues, things like that. So, oh, sorry. I've made a, um, a few puzzles for different subjects like chemistry and microbiology. And there is a website where you can put the words in that you want to use with the clue and it'll make the puzzle for you. It might not be able to incorporate all of them in, but it kind of does that work for you if you can't get the work together like that. Cause I'm not, I can't do this very well, but it more of a themed that way. And they work really nice just for general types of things. And so they're kind of fun to do with the class. Yep, for sure. And somebody else, I think. Oh yeah. When you're doing one that has a purposely has a typo or is not a word, like when you're removing the T's, you can place that into the software also, and then see if whether the puzzle is possible or how does that work? Yeah. Good question. Um, so like mad hater, for example, would not be a word in the word list because it's meaningless. Once you type it in and it completes the space there, then the software automatically allows you to consider that a usable word. Yep. Um, and there's, there's a whole bunch of sort of manual tricks that I still will use in, in creating them. Yeah. Um, just as sort of to, to show you the amount of possibility for creating different puzzles, I want to talk about a plagiarism scandal. So in 2016, um, 538.com, which is like a major statistical analysis website, they, I think they started in sports and then expanded into other things, um, published a story that talked about a plagiarism scandal where one particular editor Timothy Parker had plagiarized hundreds of puzzles that had been published elsewhere. Um, sometimes he plagiarized his own puzzles um, and published them as though they were new. Um, this is the sort of analysis that would never have been possible in 1980 before there were enormous databases, but that um, is possible now. And so here we have an example of a New York Times puzzle in 2001 um, that the USA Today published nine years later as though it were a new puzzle. Um, and in this case, um, Parker took the theme entries, but created a new fill around it, around the theme entries. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, here's an example of a different puzzle. Um, this one was a USA Today puzzle that he ran as a USA Today puzzle with a different author what you see in the dark squares there um, is just um, anything that's different between the two. But this one is basically 90% the same puzzle. And just from what you saw when I was uh, opened up the software and showed you how many different options there were, um, you can see that there's no way for a puzzle, even if you have the same theme idea, to, to be this identical to any others. Um, Parker's response was, um, to me, it's just mere coincidence. We don't look at anybody else's puzzles or really care about any else, anyone else's puzzles. Um, and that's a statement, I think, until you've tried constructing puzzles, it might seem like, well, the rules are kind of rigid. Maybe there's really not that many possibilities. Um, but when you actually begin constructing crosswords and see that in any given space, there's 150 options there, 
you can see that it's, it's impossible to create the same thing. Um, there's a really cool example. So last year, on the, on the same day, uh, two major publishers published a puzzle that had the revealer Little Italy. Um, the first puzzle was the Wall Street Journal. And these are, um, it's a rebus puzzle. So they took states in Italy and made them little. So Denver omelet was for Rome, passed the Turing test was Turin, Tropic of Capricorn was Capri or Capri. Mm. Same day, a different author also had the Little Italy revealer and made it a uh, rebus puzzle, but had four theme entries that were entirely different from the other one. <laughs> so when you look at these two puzzles, there's there's no way that there's plagiarism occurring here. They were published on the same day, but you can see that you might have a revealer and come to the same conclusion about like, oh, Little Italy suggests this. Um, but even if you have the same theme idea, you're gonna come up with a radically different puzzle than uh, somebody else would. Um, okay, really quickly, 17 minutes left. I want to talk quickly about clue writing. So once you have your grid filled, the next thing is to write clues. Um, and I want to move through these rules quickly so we can look at some examples of good clues. Um, a clue needs to be from the same part of speech. So if you've got a plural entry, the, um, the clue has to also be plural and it needs to be basically interchangeable. Um, uh, if you have an abbreviation in the clue, or excuse me, in the answer, you also must have an abbreviation in the clue. Uh, clue difficulty gets harder as the week goes on, but as I mentioned in response to Gloria's question, you don't always know what day of the week you're going to be published on. Uh, in general, you're always wanting to look at multiple meanings of a word. Um, so we'll look at examples of this in a second, but if you're trying to trick someone, you want to look at a word and think, what, what are they going to first think about? So um, for that clue about teeing off, um, start, to dr or start driving. Uh, in that case, when you hear start driving, you think of cars, but it was a misdirection. It was about a different kind of driving. So that's important. Uh, and then if you're solving, this is important too. If there's a question mark at the end of a clue, that's an indication to you that there's some sort of play on words happening it doesn't mean that it's a question. And that's one of the less sort of instinctive things for crossword solvers uh, is that the question mark has a different role. Um, so what do you do to write clues? The first thing you do to write a clue is you just think about what comes to mind to yourself and try to create something that's funny and original. Um, there are also, uh, the other important thing is that you're always trying to say a lot in very few words. So um, there's not infinite space. So you have to, you know, a seven word clue is pushing it. A three word clue is good. Um, get help. So there are databases out there, which I was going to show you if we had more time. But if you type in the word shirt in one of these databases, it will pull up every single clue that's ever been written in the New York Times for the word shirt. Um, which doesn't mean you want to just do that for every single one. But if you're cluing 78 words, some of them you're going to have really good ideas for and others you're not. Um, and it can help you be more efficient as a clue writer and then get an editor. Um, I've never done an actual study to see what percentage of my clues actually end up in the puzzles. Um, but a large number of clues that I write don't ever appear. And I always get frustrated. They, they always put in pop culture references that I don't even know. Uh, so I can't, I don't even know the clues in my own puzzles, but that's how it works. So to look at examples of good cluing, um, oh, real quick, here is how I clued those meaningless phrases um, in the tee off puzzle. So boy caught was bed for a certain camper so the question mark says it's a play on words, right? Great Scott was Kelly McDonald or David Hume. Mad Hater was Diss Track Creator. Leader Box, Certain Cheap Wine Container. 
right? Rather than litter box. Uh, fated calf was a young cow whose destiny is predetermined. So when you have those meaningless phrases that come about because of a of the theme, um, you can clue them in a way where someone can actually get to the answer, even though it's a phrase that is not an actual phrase. Um, so I want to look at some of the best clues out there. Um, the Orca Awards is, are given every year by a, a, a crossword blog called Crossword Fiend. And um, I just want to look at some of these clues that were their finalists last year for clue of the year. And um, we'll look at sort of what makes for good clues here. So the clue is in brackets and then the number of letters of the answer is in parentheses. List of things to try is a docket, right? So in this case, it's the word try, right? It's referencing a trial um, and, and law rather than what we would think of initially. Um, refuse to tap out is actually refuse to tap out. Whoop, so ashes. Uh, launching pad is a starter home. So it's using an alternate understanding of pad. Uh, brand for the rest of the people. Here the key word is rest. So it doesn't mean the other people. It means sleeping. So Sealy, a mattress brand. Uh, moves in for a short time. This was the one that they actually gave clue of the year to. Um, dance craze. So this one's good because it's using alternate definitions of two words. So moves in this case is dance moves. Um, and in is like it's a trend. It's in. So it's dance moves that are trendy for a short time. Dance craze. Um, Shot is aerial photo, May through mid-July 2019. So May here is not the month, but the prime minister. Uh, one in a semi-circle is a CB or so CB radio, semi-truck. Synagogue props, Mazel tov. And then a sex joke at the end. Toy made with no plastic junk is Ken. Uh, it's funny that um, that, was, that was a clue that was published in an independent puzzle. Um, crossword editors will say that they have a breakfast test for crosswording. Uh, and any word or any clue or anything that appears in a puzzle has to be something that would be palatable to somebody eating breakfast. <laughs> and in general, all of the major newspaper uh, publishers would not, don't allow for something like plastic junk to appear uh, in their puzzles, but some of the independent crossword publishers are, are more expansive in what they will allow or not allow. Plastic junk. <laughs> That's pretty good. I probably have, I, I teach at one o'clock, but I have a few minutes left if anyone had other questions they want to ask before we revisit the, um, the meta puzzle that I gave you at the very beginning. May I ask a clue question? Um, on those, on that puzzle, um, I think it was a Wall Street Journal puzzle that had all those nonsense words because you were doing that um, de across, down, across. Yeah, go. There, yeah. I noticed that there were a lot of words in that puzzle that didn't, that weren't words. Yep. And so I'm like, how is anyone even supposed to solve that? Right. So <laughs> I'm going to go back to that one. Wait, it's a huge PowerPoint. Yeah. So um, for instance, Corey, 20 across is listic, which is not a word, um, but it's the end of go ballistic. Yeah. So in this case, 
the clue for 20 across in parentheses, they wrote um, clued elsewhere. And 22 across also clued elsewhere. So at one across, there was a clue for the entirety of go ballistic. And in 20 across, there was no clue at all. Hmm. So my question is, in the 20th century, you were considered a wimp if you should use a crossword dictionary to try to solve a puzzle. Given your presentation today, uh, what is fair game for solving a puzzle created the way they're created today if you are trying to solve the puzzle? Well, that's going to change depending on your uh, skill as a solver. Um, so if you're brand new to puzzles and you're working on one and you can only get like five uh, entries and that's frustrating to you and you can use Google to find 10 others that then help you move through the whole grid, you should totally do that. Um, if, you, if you do puzzles consistently, over time you'll get to the point where you don't do that because you don't need to. Um, so I don't, I don't Google things now because um, it's not actually as fun. Um, and it, it takes time. So when I started solving puzzles, I would say it took me a full year of doing the New York Times every day before I could solve the Monday and the Tuesday. And I'd say it was another full year before I could solve the Wednesday and Thursday and another full year before I could consistently get the themeless puzzles on Fridays and Saturdays. But if you're having fun, you know, you, you, you'll stick with it. But uh, it's, a, it's a language and you pick up the language over time. So it's developing strengths just like swimming or any, any sport. Okay, thank you. You've made it seem really, really fun, Blake. Thank you so much. It's been pretty amazing. Um, I'll say this quickly before we look at that meta clue that I gave you. Um, now, now, now I have a new way to refer to myself as a toy made with no plastic junk. Uh, that's my, my new nickname. Uh, uh, Blake, uh, can we have um, part two sometime in the future where you if you have the, an opportunity. Yeah. To, our, our, another question is, Yakima Herald Republic crossword, what are your thoughts? I'm not, I don't know what puzzle they run, though I, I, I guarantee you they're running a syndicated puzzle. So um, they might run the universal crossword. The universal crossword appears in, I don't know, like 150 newspapers across the country. And there's a handful of uh, syndicated puzzles out there. Like the Yakima Herald runs two crossword puzzles. Two? I would bet that they're both syndicated. I, I could be wrong, but I, I think I would be familiar if the Yakima was running an original puzzle. I, I think it's probably accurate to say there's not a single uh, mid-sized newspaper in the United States that's running an original puzzle at this point. I'd be very surprised if I was wrong. Like I wanted to squeeze in uh, a quick question because it might be interesting to everybody else. Um, uh, forgive me for not remembering all the details, but when uh, there was a meeting where you had asked everybody to do a puzzle, um, if it was heritage related, I'm sorry if I can't remember, but would you be uh, interested in creating one that is all heritage based uh, clues and everybody can get into? So the puzzle that I did for all University Day in January is going to be published in Wings uh, soon. Uh, I'm working with Bonnie on when that will be. So there will be that. Yeah. Okay, so as our last thing before we go here, um, this was the anagram puzzle we did at the beginning. Uh, there are the answers. And the last question was all the anagrams were in such bad shape that they ended up at the... Anyone get it? Triage. Close. Uh, 
I'll give you time. Garbage. Okay, so my hint is all of the answers end in a certain way. ER. Yeah, there we go. Uh, <laughs> bravo. <laughs> yeah, so that's why that some of these entries were better than others is like, cause I made a rule for myself. They all had to end with ER so that we could have this meta theme at the end. Um, interestingly, the first puzzle that I wrote by hand well, the revealer was emergency room, um, and it was a terrible puzzle, but <laughs> a, a bad pun to, uh, to end our day. Uh, awesome. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thank you. Oh, Bubbo, if you stop sharing screen, we'll get whoever's in the room before I... Uh, end the recording. So yes, a big round of applause. This, I'd I like it. this is your mom. Oh, hey. <laughs> I didn't see you there. So I just saw the very end, or just saw the very end of it. In fact, I'm in Boardman, Oregon, and I can't even see you, but I listened to the last part. Anyway, I'm very proud of you. Thank oh, you. Thanks, <laughs> We recorded and we're going to try to find a way to make it widely available. Great. Thank you. All right. I probably have to leave first because I have to get to class. Thank you all. Thank you.